We welcome all of you here tonight in the name of the Lord. Those of you who are joining us by live stream, we welcome you also. We do not take the uh, fellowship of kindred spirits for granted. Amen. It's a great privilege yes. Amen. to be able to meet with uh, peaceable brethren. This will be our 22nd lesson in the book of Amos. We're in the fourth chapter. This is some hard language in this. This is God talking, and he's reacting to the belligerence and hardness of heart of the people that he saved. These are the people he saved out of the land of Egypt. And he's not been pleased with them at all. And he's telling them, he's be, now he's going to give them an interpretation of what's happened to them because they probably don't realize what's, what's happened. This is Amos 4, verses 7 through 9. And also I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One peace was rained upon and the peace whereupon it rained not withered. So Two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew, when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them, yet ye have not returned unto me saith the Lord. <clears throat> well, how hard can a heart become? How calloused can a nation become? Well, God doesn't want us to philosophize about this. He's raised up a nation to teach us, to teach us this. These are people that have been exposed to God. They're people who have been received benefits from God. They're people given the law from God. People have been fed by God, cared by God. God fought for them. How hard can people like that become? See, he's raising them up to tell you. If you're trusting in yourself like you quit. Yeah. Amen. God's teaching you. If the Lord doesn't keep the city, they labor in vain. They watch it. They have to build a house. They labor in vain to build it. It's the way it is. But see, these are lessons hard learned. Hard learned. See, mankind with what I call flimsy armor, the flimsy armor of free will, and an erroneous view of the nature of God, many professing Christians can hardly accept the idea that a person or a people can arrive at a point where they can't believe. Yeah. Right. A lot of people can't receive that. Even the word of God says in John 12, 38, therefore they could not believe, yeah. even though Jesus worked a lot of miracles right under their nose. Yeah. They could not believe. See, a lot of people, they can't accept that. They, what they've been told about God, another God, they don't think that this is the way he is. But this is the way he is. Amen. They can't accept the idea that you can come to a state where you can't be renewed to repentance. They just don't believe that. Or that you can come to a point where there's no more sacrifice for sin. 
Now, these are all things that have been revealed or said in the Word of God, but this stuff isn't being preached. A lot of the reason why it isn't is because there's too many novices in the pulpits. There's too many unknowledgeable people preaching. We got too many preachers of that sort. Religious men have continued to argue about these things, which I just mentioned. They argue about these, take sides. <laughs> One tries to overthrow the other person. No, God can't do that. No, God can't do that. God does do this. No, God doesn't do that. So they are hundreds of years they've been arguing about, about this. This is because they don't realize what happened when, quote, sin entered into the world. Amen. It's the phrase taken from Romans 5.12. Sin entered into the world. And when it did, it set in motion a series of things in humanity that boggle the mind yeah. once you see it. Oh, very few people know how serious that was. They don't know that men actually have now become servants yeah. of sin. Right. That's Romans 6, 17 Amen. and verse 20. Yeah. And that as servants of sin... They become guilty of lawlessness that leads to more lawlessness. As the King, New King James Version of Romans 6, 19. Sin unto sin, it says. They can't see that those out of Christ, they are actually children of disobedience. What a phrase that is. And they're by nature children of wrath. They can't see this. It's, they've been even blinded to this by what they've been taught. Israel had become blind to this too. And it was also because of what they were taught by their wayward priests. It's exceedingly difficult for such souls to accept the fact that there are people in, that Satan can take captive whenever he wants. That's 2 Timothy 226. There's actually people Satan can get anytime he wants them. Works in them at will. He knows who to get if he wants to have a mass shooting over in Massachusetts. He knows who to use. He can just capture them. He wants the person knows this now. This this, I, this thing about God that that becomes more critical. <laughs> You're a powerless against the devil right. on your own. Amen. And the whole human race could combine together and it'd still be powerless right. against the devil. See, once a person takes up residence in Satan's domain, he becomes weaker and weaker and indulges in sin more and more. Yeah, right. You cannot survive if you're living where Satan rules. Yeah. See, God's given him certain territory. Mm -hmm. He told Jesus, these kingdoms have been given to me. Jesus didn't say, oh, no, they have them. They have not been given to you. Mm -hmm. No, they had been given to it, Satan. Uh -huh. He knew it. Mm -hmm. That's why you can't afford to get tied to them. <laughs> tied to them, Amen. see. Now, in order to assist us in comprehending the status of a people who are not changed, they haven't been changed, they haven't been born again, the Spirit acquaints us with Israel. And it shows us how much you can do to a people like this, and it just bounces off of them like water off a duck's back. This does it just doesn't register with them. So he's, he raised up a living example. He says, we're not going to theorize about this. We're not going to hold a workshop and talk this thing out and see what you think and what you think. I'm going to show you. In flesh and blood, I'm going to show you what happens to people when they don't listen to me. I'm going to show you in concrete people what happens to people when they don't obey me. You're going to learn what, how I react to disobedience and to stubbornness and to rebellion. I, there, I have a certain reaction to these things. It's a consistent reaction. 
Now, I'm going to teach you about this. It wasn't because they hadn't received enough knowledge, academic knowledge. They received a lot of knowledge. But after 4,000 years, 1,500 of which were spent with direct tutelage in words from God, when the Messiah was sent, these people killed him. Now let's look at this uh, text. Now remember in these, thus far God, ha God is telling Israel what he's done right now. He's not telling them what he's going to do. He's telling them what he's done. They, they haven't seen it yet. They've, they've experienced the judgment of God, but they don't, they, don't, they don't realize it. So he's going to tell them, tells the people what he's done. Because they've not associated what's happened with God himself. I have withholden the rain from you. Well, men call it a drought. Yeah. It hasn't rained now for a long time. we got a serious drought. The voice thunders out of heaven. I stopped it from raining. I did that. I withheld the rain. See, the people knew it hadn't rained. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they didn't know why. They didn't want to know why. Now, we were talking about somebody like David or somebody like that. He said, why hasn't it rained? They'd have went to God and inquired. Why hasn't it rained? And he'd have told them. They didn't, so he tells them anyway. Sends a messenger to tell him, I withheld the rain. And when did he withhold it? When it was needed the most. Three months before the harvest. When the, that's the latter rain. It was going to right cause the grain to ripen. That's when he shut off the water. I did that, he said. Plants were growing good. Boy, you were looking like surveyed the fields. Or things are doing good in the fields now. Heads are starting to ripen. Things are looking good. Oop, didn't rain three months before harvest. We needed rain. We needed rain bad, but it didn't rain. But they didn't go to God. So God went to them and said, I kept the rain from coming down on your, where you are. I stopped it. Before they entered into Canaan, God told Israel, Deuteronomy 11, 14. This is before Moses died. They're on the verge of entering into Canaan. It shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, to serve him with all your heart, all your soul, all your heart and all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. So he told them right up front. Here's the agreement. You do what I say to do, all of it, and I'll make it rain when you need the rain Amen. so you can gather in, your, gather in your crops. So the, re the requirements were clear enough. I mean, who doesn't understand? Uh, the young child, any child that could read and knows what that says, understands it. Nothing to argue about. Yet they did not take heed to the Lord, but instead they were noted for disobedience. Yeah, yeah. Nehemiah said that in Nehemiah 9, 26. They disobeyed. He said, if you obey, here's what I do, but they disobeyed. Yeah. So if it's really true, you can't do anything to make God change what he thinks about you, then these words are false. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit's lied to us. Mm -hmm. I don't see how you have an alternative to this. Somebody's lied. Amen. Either the people that say that have lied, yeah. mm -hmm. or the prophet lied. Yeah. 
Now I'll tell you which one I, I'm siding with the prophet. Amen. God can't lie. Men can lie. That's why they do lie. <laughs> for each of us in our own capacity uh, not to assume that the people under our teaching, so to speak, understand these connections to the Lord, these associations. Whether, whether it be a preacher preaching the truth, whether it be someone leading in a, a Bible study, I was in that situation one time, or whether it be parents with our own children. Yeah. Don't, don't assume that all of all these men, all of our children have the very clear associations with what's happening to, to the Father. Amen. But to make them known, proclaim it so that they see them very clearly. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 This is the truth. The apostles, yeah. Jesus did this and the apostles did this. <coughs> so now he's going he's gonna to tell them why their crops haven't yielded. Now let's, say, let's take a moment and, and apply this truth. Because God's not changed his nature, he can't, he can't do so. Why is it that some people have supposedly been in Christ for some time, but they've not yielded any fruit? Why is that? Is it possible that God has withheld showers of blessing? Amen. You don't have to make a determination he has, but isn't that possible? Isn't that a possible explanation for a lack of fruitfulness? A lack of yielding something up to God that pleases him? Isn't that possible that God won't let that happen? Yeah. It's possible. This is why gatherings, is, this po is it possible? That this is why some gatherings are fruitless and boring is, 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 is possible. So you've got to think. You've got to think about these things. If, uh, we've got situations where it looks like people are wasting their time. No fruits being produced. Nothing that satisfies the soul. Now, a person who is a thinking person want some kind of an explanation for this condition because if some theology is right, this defies explanation. If the people are right that say that God never changes about his view of people, that he, you're once you're in, you're always in. If that's true, then they, we've got a real problem now explaining these conditions happening. Do people really imagine they can live in the darkness? and still enjoy the benefits of the light? Yes, there are some people that think that. They're living for the devil, and they ask you to pray that they'll get well. Hmm? Does this not happen? They're, li they're living in, away from God, and they ask you to pray that they'd be better off, find a better job. You say, well, should we? Well, that's uh, you'll have to figure that out. But you should let the people know, look, it's my obligation to tell you that if you want God to bless you, you're going to have to shape up your life. Amen. And you can't be dawdling around to do it. You want God to act quick, don't you? Hmm? You want God to come right now and help you out, don't you? I mean, you got to tell them this, people. They don't know this. Say, well, now for God to do that, you got to be just that quick to please him and change your course and make straight paths for your feet and cease to do evil and sin not and seek the Lord with all your heart. Then uh, you have a reason to have a heavy prospect. Yes. This, he said, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, yes. we lie yes. do not and do not the truth. Yeah. Isn't that an interesting phrase, do not the truth? That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I've withheld the rain. The Philistines, hey, they were bringing their crops in. Boy, they had fruit for The Midianites over there, they had some good fruit. I didn't let it rain on you. Well, he gets down more particular. 
I caused it to rain on one city. <laughs> now you're going to find that God is discretionary. There was more than one city. I made it run on, rain on one city, and I withheld rain from another city. It may have been just down the road. That's gone. We'll talk about God now. I made it rain in Springfield, but it didn't rain in Mount Vernon. Brother Jeremy. Yeah, just recently on um, Google, you can look at the the map of where Israel is, and it almost looks like a line around that whole area because it's all brown from being dead, and right there where Israel is, yeah. it's all green, and, yeah. and it wasn't like that before. That's but see, right. that, Amen. That's exactly what you're talking about. Amen. I made this connection with um, uh, doctors and medications and stuff. I've noticed that... So Two people take the exact same thing, and one it's effective, and the other one it's, it's not. not. Yeah. And of course, you know, yeah. God can do that. He can. Amen. He can just make it work. <laughs> one group of people were sustained; the other group of people weren't. The deliberate act of God caused this situation. One city got rain. One city didn't get rain. Now, when Israel was in the land of Goshen, where his people dwelt, none of the plagues were in Goshen. They were all in Egypt. He made the plagues fall on Egypt, kept them from falling on Goshen. See, this is God. He has discretionary judgment. Now, on a spiritual level, this is still happening. There are some cities that have received nourishment from heaven and the works of God can flourish in them. There's other cities that can't. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Now, being up from the Chicago area, for years people tried to start a new church in Chicago. <laughs> they finally got one started, but they only met on Sunday in a the theater and it was very short. Why? God hasn't let it rain on Chicago. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Or Las Vegas. Or New York. Mm -hmm. Or Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Or you just check them out. Mm -hmm. No one's been able to do very much in those cities. One city got the rain. One yeah. city Amen. didn't get the rain. There are some places where there are, are more God-fearing believers than other places. If you've done much travel, you head out west, it's like a spiritual desert. Yeah. Up in Canada, you can't even find a, a church like of a Christian background. You just find Baha'i, Baha'i, and Muslim, and places like that. Oh, yeah, God kept the rain. There's places like this. Now, you go out west, you see just a bunch of spiritual flakes. You, it's hard to find even find something you would you'd be glad to find an old dead church you'd be glad to find it but you it's just barren yeah. it's plum barren mm -hmm. why god didn't let it rain mm -hmm. Amen. that's why that even gets more particular than that i cause it to rain on one piece of ground <laughs> one field two there's two fields adjacent to each other I caused it to rain on field A. I didn't let it rain on field B. Does God do that? Well, it's right here in the text, yes. I have seen bad rainstorms come and it rained on one side of the street, but not on the other. I, I've actually seen it. I say, boy, that's something. That God did that. God, yes. It's a lot of drops of water coming down out of heaven. There's all kind of winds that seem to contradict that you could draw a fine line between one field and another. But God can make it rain on one field and that one drop fall on the field next to it. Talking about God now. <laughs> I don't think men could reach that conclusion on their own. So God tells them. From the vast reservoirs from which rain comes, Job 28, 26 says, he made a decree for the rain. Yeah. Go here. Yes. 
That's God. Go there. Don't go here. That's God. He focused on one parcel of ground and refused to let it fall to another. In the plagues of Egypt, God severed between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. That's what the word says. He severed the blame disease fell on Egypt's cattle, didn't fall on Israel's cattle. Yes, but the same come into play when Jesus comes again. Two will be working in the field. One will be taken, but the other will be left. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. two, two will be on the housetop, on the top on top of a house praying, and one will be taken, but the other one will be left yeah. behind. Amen. So pe people who say that God doesn't have favorites need to think again before they say that. If you've been involved in the work of the Lord to a measurable degree, you have experienced what I'm going to say. You have sat in a meeting where everybody heard the same message and the person sitting on this side responded to it and the person sitting on that side rejected it. I've seen it. I've seen it happen. What caused that? God rained on one, didn't rain on the other. The end of that is, is you made some advancement. There's some people who will not, they will not say that God does something. That's right. Remember when he sent the hail to Egypt? It says in Exodus 9, 26, only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were was there no hail. It, did, it didn't hail over there. <laughs> And when a thick darkness fell on Egypt, all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Exodus 10, 23. See, God makes distinctions. Amen. You've seen these, some of these distinctions. I know you have. But it's good to think about it. Yeah. Some people you were raised up with, you were inclined to the truth. And some of these people maybe went to the same church you went to. They didn't. They didn't say why, why. What was that? He rained on one, and he didn't on another. He opened the eyes of one. He didn't open the eyes of the other. Say why did God do that? Well, that's God. He'll explain it someday. I can't. I can't explain it to you. I don't know why. I know in some cases why, but I'm not an expert in the why. Now, what about where it didn't rain? Well, he says where it didn't rain. The peace withered, yeah. crop withered. Where it didn't rain, it withered. Yeah. Same seed, right? Same seed was planted. Yes. Yeah. One grew, the other withered. Amen. Now it's still this way, brother. It's still this way. Whatever isn't watered withers. Yes. Now, people may argue about what's more important, witnessing to the lost or witnessing to the Lord, people of God. People may argue about that, but whatever doesn't receive water withers. And the only people that need watering are the saints. The others got to be, the others have to come up in the field. They're not even in the field. No water, wither. Could it be that that's? Could it be that that's what's happened? That we've witnessed this sort of thing happening, people fizzling out for the Lord. Yes, I, I believe it is. It testifies to a people that God chose Israel. God delivered them. God nurtured them. And he changed his mind about him. Hmm. Why? Because they were reverting, they were drawing back from him. They were, they were pulling back from him. See, this always, is, it's like a, a car that's about to die. At first it starts to miss a little. Then it starts sputtering. 
and finally it dies. Now I've seen, <laughs> I've seen this happen to people. You want zealous for the Lord, but they start missing this assembly, yeah. missing that assembly, and they begin to blabber a lot. They begin to talk a lot, to say things that shouldn't be talking. Finally, they just drop off the vine. Why? No water. Because yeah. God won't give water. Jesus said, whosoever believeth on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But they aren't going to flow out of anybody else's belly, let me tell you. Thank God for the grace that enables us to be blessed. Amen. The thing that makes experientially, from your objective viewpoint, the thing that makes it effective for you is that you, you desire it and you won't let anything stop you from getting it. Yes. Not throw your pearls before the swine. That's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. He doesn't either, does he? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's the situation with God. He didn't let the rain fall. Didn't put. He let it rain on one city, not on another. Let it rain on one field, not on another. So now we got this dilemma. Some folk got water, and some folk don't. Yes. Now, I know there's no contradiction here, but I know what some people would bring up when you mention this. And that's what Jesus said he, here in Matthew 5, where he says that, he, that God makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, I, like I said, I know there's no contradiction, but what would be the proper way to reconcile that? Well, he's not talking about crops. Jesus wasn't talking about crops. He's talking just about the normality of the cooling of the earth. Yeah. Here he's talking about crops. Yeah. He doesn't say he, it doesn't say he always sends rain on the just on the unjust. It doesn't say that's what they like to but that's not what the text says. God always sends rain on the that's not what he said. He said he sends. I mean, it may be quite a period of time in between the sending, but he, he sends. So that would be the answer, I'd say, to, to that sort of thing. <clears throat> so, view of the situation, two or three cities wandered into one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have you not returned to me, saith the Lord. Two or three cities. Some other versions read that they'd stagger to another city out of, out of weakness. Staggered from town to town, see, hunting for water. The other says the people from two or three cities went, which I, I think that is the idea there. They did, we don't have we don't have any water, so let's see, see if we can find a city that got some water. Because you rained on one city, down another. So let's see if we can find cities that got some water. But these people. Uh, they're very weary, and it's hard to get to the city, you see. They're very weary. Those so affected wandered. They weren't sure. They weren't sure which city it rained on. As they, <laughs> they had to find, but they must have heard, hey, there's a city over there in Arabia. They got some rain. So they had begun. Now, this is the way it is with God. He doesn't give all the answers to the ungodly. We need to seek. That is what he means. Yeah. Seek. Mm -hmm. You've got to make a concerted effort to find out, find where, this, yeah. where the needed resources are. Yeah. Yes. God can put you in a judgment that only God can deliver Amen. you from. Amen. When they Amen. went down to Babylon, only God was the one who freed them. That's, That's right. Them. Amen. This kind of experience was referenced by the psalmist. In one of his imprecatory psalms, which are hard for men to receive, of his enemies the psalmist prayed, Let them wander up and down for meat, and grudge if they be not satisfied. Psalm 109.10 says, Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. <laughs> Seems like this is, whoa, this is, this is kind of hard. Didn't Jesus say, pray for your enemies, do good to them, despitefully use you, and so forth? Yes. Yes, he did say that. 
we're we're talking about a different type of thing here. Perhaps the psalmist wasn't praying out of a spirit of vindictiveness. Maybe revenge isn't what made him say that. Maybe be, he said that because he knew God. Maybe that's why he said it. See, you've got to think the thing through <laughs> a little bit. Paul, here's what he said. Told Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.14, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Well, like that won't be a nice reward, will it? Do evil to the apostle whom God had entrusted the mystery to, and you do evil to him? You take a person that God has preferred and you do evil to him? Huh? You take a person God's opened up the truth to and you talk against him? Not going to go well. Mm. Yes. That's right. Chapter 12. Mm. That's right. With worms. That's right. Touch not my pro anointed. Do my prophets no harm. God means that. Amen. We must, uh, you must exercise godly caution, of course, in this sort of area. You don't want to be hasty to curse people and stuff like that. That's not what we're insinuating. But we're saying that God has revealed himself in a certain way and you want to have respect under this, it relieves you of any responsibility to take vengeance, but God said, I will yes. avenge. Yes. It won't go by me. I just thought about that as you said that. He said, let the Lord reward you. That's right. Paul wasn't going to spend a lot of time no. on getting all, like some people, they get all worked up. Let the Lord take care of you. He didn't say, Timothy, see if you can round up a few people and go over there and teach that Alexander a lesson. He let go of the thing. Because uh -huh. he knew God. He knew uh, God's not going to be indifferent about this situation. Since it didn't rain some on some cities, their water supply is exhausted, so they're seeking water someplace else. And apparently they found some, but they were not satisfied. Yeah, it wasn't enough. Just got a little small sip. Ezekiel said, woke up, they had to drink water by measure and with astonishment. Here's one ounce for you today. It's enough to keep you alive, but it's sure not enough to satisfy you. Limited Micah spoke of this thing, of dissatisfaction. The prophets who spoke about this, I say this because there is an enormous amount of dissatisfaction in our society. Yeah. So now we're going we're gonna to trace it back to its, yeah. to its source. Here's what Micah said. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. You won't have enough. Haggai I refer to this condition. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but you're not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there's none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put them into a bag full of holes. You, <laughs> you can't get enough to eat. You can't get enough to drink. You can't get enough clothes to be warm. Just enough to continue your misery. Why does that happen? That, that's how, re that's how re refined divine judgment is. He can let you have a little bit, but not enough. Eat a little bit, but not enough. Have a little bit of clothing, but not enough. And you're in this constant state of dissatisfaction. Now, I know people have been living in dissatisfaction for years. But it would be very hard for them to believe that yeah. something like this had actually happened. This is not the description of just an unfortunate people. It's a bit... It's a record of a people who provoked God, and this is what God did. Yes. Spiritually speaking, we have this kind of situation all around us. Multitudes of professing Christians are eating and drinking, but they're not satisfied. They go to church, but they're not satisfied. They read the literature, but they're not satisfied. They attend all the workshops, they're not, they're just not satisfied. 
over That's here right. and look. A little shop and don't yeah. try to find a place, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it ends up they're not satisfied. Mm -hmm. But they don't always just say it like this, but you, you can pick up on it, that they're not satisfied. Some people have just learned to stay barely alive. Yeah, yeah. They've learned just to be barely alive. Yeah. Yeah. They think that that's the norm. Yeah. But it's not, not in the kingdom. This isn't the norm. And the day of salvation, such a condition is a judgment from God. When professing Christians remain in this kind of state, God's judged. That's what the trouble is. Why? That the why is not the point. God's in control, complete control, of what satisfies and what's productive. Amen. Amen. Only God can give this. Yeah. It cannot come from any other source. Yeah. So if it's not productive and it's not satisfying, God shut it off. That's what happened. Amen. And it's man's business to probe into this and find out why. Or, shall we say, work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. See, divine intentions can't be overthrown by men. If God's purpose is to make you, is to make you grow up into him in all things, and for you to be satisfied and for living waters to flow out of your belly and for you to be drink with joy water out of the wells of salvation, if that's God's purpose, no one external to you can cause that not to happen. Amen. you got to see this. <clears throat> Yet God said, you have not returned unto me. Now he's confirming to men and angels the condition of their hearts. See, Michael? See? Gabriel? Michael, get your angels. Come, on. Come over to this prayer. Lean over these ramparts up here and behold his people. Some of you delivered these goods to them. So you, you're familiar with what I did to these people. Look, look at here. Look at here what they're doing. I'd say, angels, they don't. Yeah. Well, cut them off, Lord, like you did the devil. Mm -hmm. See, it's a mystery a couple of ways. Why it happens a mystery and why God tolerates it is a mystery too. Why you said that this didn't eliminate them. But uh, that's not what... God didn't have that in mind. Men have philosophized about why Israel didn't return, but the scriptures are pretty clear about it. It's because they became stubborn and rebellious. Yes, and several of the prophets, Moses started by telling them, you've been stubborn from the day I knew you. And all through the prophets said it. They didn't. This sentence is five times mentioned in this chapter. Yet they return not to me five times in this. And this is not a lengthy chapter. This has got 13 verses in it. And five times this is mentioned. It's a little over every fourth, word, every fourth verse. This is mentioned. They return not to me. Jeremiah said the same thing. He said, and I said, after she had done all these things, turn now unto me. But she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Jeremiah 3, 7. I called for her return. The door was open. Hey, it wasn't. The door wasn't closed yet. Hosea talked about this. He said, and the pride of Israel testified to his face and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. How hard can a person get? That hard. Yeah. Yeah. That hard so that the Lord can pummel them pretty hard. Uh -huh. Enough to wake about anybody up. Yeah. And it would do no good. They didn't return. We have a similar situation in our time. Mm -hmm. The modern church has let the world in among them. And it's learned the world's ways. And as a consequence, the means of nourishment can't be accessed by them. Amen. That's why. Got the world in. God won't, God won't hobnob with the world. Religious men may, but God won't. As a consequence, the means of nourishment can't be accessed. He won't let it rain on that kind of assembly. 
No. They might pray for revival and do a lot of that. You won't let it rain on that. Yet there is no open avowal to seek the Lord by these people. No one in all these churches has said, you know, no one's risen up and said, we must seek the Lord. We, we've got to seek the Lord. Something's wrong here. Let's, let's stop all, this, all of this uh, religious hubbub. Let's cut off all the things we're doing. Let's start seeking the Lord, and let's not get away from this till we find out what to do. I never have heard of anybody doing that. I'm sure that somebody has, but, I, but that's what has to be done. Until that's done, things are not going to improve. It was kind of like downcast like this, but he had a different kind of spirit. He he said to the angel, he said, where are the miracles? Yeah, where are the miracles? He's been thinking about this. God's not with us, in other words. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Well, that's about to change you. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. See, God has taken away what's needed to please him. Now he continues. He's not through yet. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the pommel worm devoured them, yet have ye not returned unto me. There it is again, saith the Lord. Now I remember Israel was an agricultural nation. And so this thing about fields and rain and so forth, that's uh, that that's very important because this is the kind they were an agricultural nation this is how they lived with the fruit of the field I, now he has already told them I withheld the rain I rained on this parcel and I didn't rain on that parcel but I've smitten you with blasting and mildew blasting is scorching heat that causes the plant to wither so some plants manage to manage to grow up a little bit, see? Like the seed on rocky soil. So some of them grow up a little bit and God sent a scorching wind and just killed it with heat, just blasted it. <laughs> While I was growing up. Mildew is a is a, a minute coating of fungi that causes the plant to die. It's similar to what Joel referred to when he said, "Thy seed is rot, rotted, under rotten under the clods." So it never got a never got a start because it, the seed rotted under the under the ground, rotted. See, God did that. Yes, the mildew can cause that to seed or to a to a plant. See, God did not let some crops ever develop. Yes. Hit them right away. Joel spoke of such a blight coming upon the seed while it was under the ground. In the, when De Solomon prayed to God at the dedication of the temple, he said, if there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew. See, he, he knew about that. Haggai referred to this kind of judgment. He said, I smote you with blasting and mildew. There it is. God mentioned blight and mildew as one of the curses that come on Israel if they didn't keep his covenant, Deuteronomy 28, 22. This is not something God let happen to Israel. This is something God did to Israel. See, that's what you've... It isn't that God gave permission for this to be done. He caused it to be done. Part of the point that Israel should have known this. They should have known God. You know, they should have had enough knowledge of God. Control all these things. Yes. See, uh, that's the jeopardy of falling yeah. away. Is yeah. You lose your hold of what God is like, and so you can't make the connection between what's happening to you and the judgment of God. See, that's what sin does to a person. And it dulls the senses so they don't know what may be obvious to you. They, they can't see it at all. Well, you didn't let it drop there. When, the, when your fig trees and olive trees increase, so some survive the the lack of rain, and some survived the blast of the mildew, and when they increased, the pommel worm devoured them. 
when your other versions say when your gardens increase, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees, the locusts devour them. So plants grow up pretty soon, blossoms, as leaves and as blossoms. When the leaves and the blossoms are on here, in come the locusts, and they devour the, the, everything from the branch to the blossom. I would, I, I, send, I send them there to do that. Curse took place as the plants were beginning to bud and blossom. You ever seen that happen to somebody? Matter of fact, you may have said, I, I've said this. Oh, they were really doing good. I remember when they were really doing good. Remember some of those things they said in the fellowship? Remember that? Remember this devotion they gave? Said, oh, boy, that was really good. Well, what, what happened? They were blasted with mildew. That's what happened. Amen. Amen. Their hearts weren't right, and God withered them up. Not a judgment we made. Thank God, I don't want to make a judgment yeah. like that. The promised benefits of the covenant, old covenant, were all external. Mm -hmm. yes. Every one of them. They were all external. They mentioned Deuteronomy 28, 2 through 13. They'd be blessed in the city, mm -hmm. blessed in the field. Blessed would be the fruit of their body, the fruit of the ground, the fruit of their cattle, and the increase of their kind and sheep. Their basket and store would be blessed. They'd be blessed going out, coming in. Their enemies would be smitten. The Lord had blessed the storehouses and everything they set their hand to do in the land he had given them. He would make them plenteous in goods, in the fruit of the body, in the fruit of their cattle, and in the fruit of the land. He would also give the rain to their land in its season. That's if you keep all my judgments. Yeah. See? Yeah. But everything he named was of the earth. Yeah. Nothing about names written in heaven, eternal inheritance, ever without, nothing like that. Yeah. See, so in an economy like that, you see what this, how serious this no rain and yeah. blight and so forth. Yeah. See, in the economy of salvation, you can have a blight in Judea and it's not because it's a curse. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. See? Uh -huh. See, and, and because the people of God are strangers in the earth, they don't consider it the same way that yeah. these would have considered it, yeah. see? We're under a covenant of better things. Yeah. And God hasn't said to us, I'll not let a, I'll not let a, not let a famine come to the USA. Mm -hmm. Don't you worry, you Christians, don't you worry. None of you will ever lose your jobs. They'll never have any, you'll never have any miscarriages in your, among your people. Yeah. See? There's nothing like that promise to people in Christ. Right. And the reason it isn't, isn't because God's hard. It's because we don't belong here. Yeah. And sometimes things like that happen to remind us we don't belong yeah. here. Amen. You can see that, can't make sense out of, out of all that. Yet he said, um, you've not returned. It's not you haven't, you haven't been given enough benefits. It's not that I haven't laid the rod to you enough. Mm, that's right. I'm showing you what's, what sin's done to you. Sin's made you this way so that not even the hand of the Lord by striking you can't straighten you out. Yes. What you need is a new heart Amen. That's right. and a new spirit. Yes. And only God can give that. But he demonstrated that before he gave it. He yes. demonstrated this was the case. Yes. So you see the theologians who argue about this, they have made a serious and a critical error in judgment. Yes. God has already proved that man can't change himself. Amen. He's proved that beyond all doubt. And he didn't do it with Arabians mm -hmm. and people from the Mediterranean he did it by select by a select people that he chose, he cultured, he nourished, he fed, and then he showed you that even that people has to be born again. Amen. Amen. See? Now there's something to be learned here before we close. Similar things have happened in the Christian world. There's a spiritual hunger and thirst. The eighth chapter, God's going to elaborate on this. Spiritual hunger and thirst. 
is a spiritual hunger and thirst that for some cannot be satisfied. I know some of these people by name. I've known them for many years. And they're in the same state as they were 25 years ago, except maybe a little worse. Dissatisfied, still can't find rest, still insist on going to the same old place, you know. Dead as a doornail. They're weak. They're wandering from city to city, from church to church, trying to see if we could get a little bit of water. Now we found some water here. Uh, trouble was, it was in those three ounce cups. Well, this church is like this, brother. They're serving it up in three ounce cups. What you're supposed to use for mouthwash, they're using this to sustain your life. And it's bad water, too. On top of everything else. What's the cause of this growing circumstance? Why does this circumstance exist? Well, it's because the preachers aren't preaching. Well, yeah, that, that has something to do with it. All right. But let's trace it back to its source. It's God's turned off the spigot. That's what's happened. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. When I found out as a young man that that was the cause, I said, I'm not going where the flutter's not flowing. Yeah. That's it. Amen. That's it for me. Mm -hmm. I've, salvation develops an insatiable thirst yes. and a hunger yes. in the people that taste of the Lord. And they just can't be satisfied with meager portions. They Amen. just can't. That's all it is. And if they insist on being satisfied, pretty soon their appetite withers and shrinks up. Pretty soon they have no appetite at all. Their mind tells them I need more, so they wander about, you know. There's always, of course, there's a remnant. Even in this time, there was a remnant. Like in Malachi's day, there were some people that feared the Lord and spoke often one with another. You know, I've been thirsty. You've been thirsty, too? Yeah, I've been thirsty. I was reading the other day, and I got some, got some water here in the Psalms or the Jeremiah or wherever. Yeah, they spake off from one with another, and they kind of supposed to gave each other some water and yeah. some food. There's always that remnant. But even these people can tell you that they've often suffered from hunger and thirst. And sometimes it comes at the worst times when a crisis strikes your life, and you would to God you had a big inventory of spiritual goods, but there you got a couple of crumbs in your spiritual cupboard, and you're in the middle of a great big crisis. Maybe your wife or husband left you, or your child died. Some big crisis, see? Satan doesn't tell people when he deceives them. He doesn't tell people that, boy, it hurts when you, don't, when you pass through a trial and you don't have any resources. This is not a pleasant experience at all. He is very well likened to hunger and thirst, like that precedes death, hunger and thirst. So I'm... Uh, I'm very grateful this passage is in Scripture and that God told you how detailed his control is. See, it's, we know that he's the governor among the nations, but now you've seen a kind of a micro view of it. <laughs> you see how detailed it is. One city, not another. One field, not another. So look at yourself, in a sense, in your heart, as a field. Look at it as a field. And you may look around you and say, oh, boy, a lot of dry fields out there. God can rain on your field, yes, amen. even though he doesn't on the one next to you. Uh -huh. Huh? Yeah. That's a piece of good news, and God will be faithful to do it. Because wherever he finds a tender and contrite heart, yes. he'll send the rain. Amen. He will. He'll send the rain. Amen. And if your borders are correct and you really want to please God, you... you the rain may not have come yet, but he's going to make it rain. Amen. He'll give you that latter rain when you need it to bring in the fruit. He'll, he'll send it. Amen. And if you have a word you'd like to add, Sister Barb. Another one of those contrasting words mm -hmm. about considering the seed that was hit with the mildew. Mm -hmm. the, the Lord said, I am able to increase your seed. So, Amen. So Amen. Another one of those contrasting Amen. 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 Yeah, it's good to be able to do well with with um, the kind of people that the Lord's raining on a lot. 
you know, yeah, yeah, coming yeah. to the assembly, you may be having a dry time, but you get around the saints, you get around those people that have well-watered fields, yeah. and, and you'll be able to partake of, of, of some of their blessings, and before before long, you'll be nourished up, yeah. and he'll be raining Amen. on your field, too. Yeah. And what will happen is when they have a dry season, they'll be able to come over to your field. Amen. Amen. That's right. This is out of their belly shall flow living, living water. Amen. Amen. That's fresh and cool and fresh. Spring yes. water. Yeah. It's nutritious. That's right. It's, nutritious. it's water that springs up. It's not like a stagnant water. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Yes, you have to know the source of this water, too. It, it yeah. Jesus spoke, spoke about this to the Samaritan woman. He said, if you knew the gift of God, yeah. if you knew who That's spoke right. to you, That's you would ask me for one. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. It would be right. like saying, I, I, I want some tea. I know what tea comes from. Tea comes from leaves. I'll go outside and pick some maple leaves off the tree and <laughs> seep down some hot water, and there we go. Got tea. Well... You don't really know what tea is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you easy. knew. That's if you, right. If you knew. That's yeah. good. That's a good word. Yeah, say that. Yes, it's Sarah. Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you will never thirst. That's right. Amen. 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 <laughs> Satisfying. Satisfying. Amen. Yeah, never go to another source. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, this, uh, this Amos keeps getting better and better to me. Yeah. Didn't you like that one field, not another? <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation you've given to our brother Amos and for this uh, perspective of raining on one field and not on another. We are praying, Father, for the showers of blessing on our field. And we thank you for the grace to keep it at our field in good shape. In Jesus' name, amen.